All right, good morning. We're here at Grand Central Terminal, the beautiful, magnificent uh, terminal that Jackie Kennedy actually saved uh, from demolition by property developers. And they wanted to rip this magnificent public transportation hub down in the 60s. And Jackie Kennedy led uh, a popular revolt to, uh, to prevent the developers uh, who apparently bought the air rights uh, and, and, the, and, and were influential to uh, rip this down. And she actually preserved this magnificent uh, terminal. And uh, speaking of property and the rights of private property, I think it's apt that we have here with us someone who has studied and is a professor at university and has taught American history and the philosophy of property rights in colonial America and, and, and in uh, intellectual history. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Yeah. No? I've never taught American history. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm certified to teach it in high school, but I haven't taught oh, it. Oh, okay. All right. What I, what, I, what I taught was law and poverty oh, okay. in two Indian law schools. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, I'm a lawyer. Oh, you're a lawyer. Okay. Yeah, I'm a lawyer. So you're the uh, philosophy of the legal theory of property. Is that what you, uh, how would you define? I taught some property law, but primarily okay. I taught the philosophy of law, jurisprudence. Okay, got it. Okay. okay. What's right. your name? What's your Richard name? Richard Duffy. Richard Duffy. Thank you for this correction, Mr. Duffy. <laughs> professor Duffy. My uh, apologies for. I'm mis not a professor now. Okay, well, All retired right. Professor Duffy. Okay, and I can tell you're a lawyer because you're very precise in the way you corrected my ignorance. So, uh, okay, I stand corrected. Now, let's continue. Uh, right, we well were then. talking about developers who apparently were influential enough to have this gigantic uh, transportation hub condemned in the early 60s and they're going to rip it down and put up something new like they did over Madison Square Garden uh, which was also a magnificent uh, room like this and got totally demolished uh, in the 60s but this one was preserved can you tell us about property law in Western history and how it influenced our government, our constitution. The most important thing to understand is yeah. about British property law. Uh huh. I I could talk about the history of it a bit. Yeah. Now, British British property law developed out of the Norman invasion of Britain in 1066. Prior to 1066, the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, Celts, living in England after the Romans left. Right, had their own indigenous system, and they were primarily peasants. Um, when William the Conqueror killed Harold and took over the country, he proclaimed himself the owner of all of Britain, and he farmed out his rights to manage Britain to his nobles, who are the basis of the aristocracy of Britain, that still continues today. So William said, look, God wants him to rule Britain. He owns all of Britain and his caretakers, his plenipotentiaries, are his nobles. Now, they adopted a set of laws for the occupation of Britain because for the first 200 years after 1066, there was uh, all of the business of the court was conducted in French and Latin alone in order to exclude the British from having any effect on their own affairs. The British were stripped of all property rights and only the Norman French had these rights via the king. Right? The idea under which the peasants suffered was that they were not responsible for growing the crops that they grew, and they did not own the land that they'd been living on for hundreds of years. Instead, the king owned the land, and the property system, the feudal law, was a complete legal system. That is, they were peasants were totally obligated to the lord of the manor who made the judicial decisions for them and had all kinds of power over them. 
uh, they were obligated to deliver one to two thirds of their crops to the Lord of the Manor. The assumption was that God made the crops grow, God and the earth. The peasant supposedly had nothing to do with it. The peasant was recognized as having the privilege to be there when the crops were ready for harvest. And so he had the privilege of harvesting the crops, taking most of them generally to the lord of the manor, and he was allowed to stay on the land as a privilege after that. Right? Now, the crucial problem with this is this was the system of an army of occupation. And that system was maintained through British property law and was applied, one, to the colonies in the United States and all over the rest of the world. That is, all of the countries that have British common law and that have inherited property law have the same oppressive system and that system renders them with a greater difference between the rich and the poor than any other bunch of countries. That is, if you look at the Gini coefficient, which is the, so the best single figure showing the ratio of the rich to the poor, either by income or by wealth, which are quite different, right? you'll find that the British Commonwealth countries in any particular area always have a higher, or that's more wealth in the hands of the wealthy right, than the countries surrounding them do. So the United States has the single highest Gini coefficient, that is the greatest concentration of wealth in the hands of the rich, of any developed country, with occasional small challenges to this figure from Singapore and Hong Kong which are both entrepot states, they're just value-added states, right? Um, the particular oppressiveness of this becomes really visible once the factory system starts. Because the laws regarding factories and businesses maintain the same structure that the laws, that the laws for the aristocracy ruling the peasants had. Namely, that the worker just happened to be there when things came out of the factory, but that the worker's labor did not contribute to the manufacture of the goods. Therefore, there was never any right that the worker got to anything like the value of his labor in exchange. Instead, he maintained the same role that the peasant had, which was that the owner of the factory owned everything that went through the factory, was totally responsible for it all, and the worker, like the peasant, just got as a privilege anything that the owner intended to give him. Therefore, you've guaranteed the rights of investors and managers, but have never guaranteed people's right to the value of their own labor. And that's the essential oppressive feature of countries that share British property law. Now, the problem when those countries become independent is that many major features of their legal systems and therefore their economic systems, which are based on their legal systems, are maintained in the same status that they had under the British. Okay? This didn't just happen in the United States. I can give you, for instance, the example of India. We'll talk about India first to make what happened in the U.S. a little clearer. In India, when independence was proclaimed in 1947, the Indians started to write a constitution. The Indians recognized that 90% of Indians had never been allowed to own property because under the Hindu law system, you could only own property if you had had the Upanayana ceremony given to you by a guru, which meant that only the men of about 10% of the population were eligible to own anything. Okay? Now, the Constitution recognized this, said this was grossly unfair, and therefore set aside a huge amount of land in the country to be redistributed to people who had never been eligible to own it. So the people, instead of being tenant farmers, 
could therefore be be right be so what have year their was own this home. constitution what? what year was this in 40s, the independence was in 47 the constitution was promulgated in the early 50s okay okay the problem was all the Indian judges have been trained in British property law and they all said the government does not have the right to give away this property without compensation at fair market value. The government never had that money. So only one and a half percent of the money of, of the land that the Indian Constitution sets aside to be redistributed has ever been redistributed because the British, the judges trained in British property law violated their own constitution in order to maintain the rights of property owners. Now, the same thing has happened in lots of ex-colonies of Britain, happened here also. Declaration of Independence says that the army is going to fight for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are supposed to be inalienable rights. Okay? Now, the pursuit of happiness came from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and it was a huge body of philosophical thought about what makes it possible for people to pursue their happiness that could easily have been developed into a legal system that would have guaranteed people's rights to live a, to, to live a decent life. But instead, the Constitution wrote life, liberty, and property. Right? The phrase in, of, uh, of um, pursuit of happiness never occurs again, and the the Declaration of Independence is not technically part of American law. And so that stream was shut out, was replaced with property. Now, when the Constitution first came out, there were riots on the docks of New York City. People walking around with signs saying, one tyrant is as bad as another, because they knew that the Constitution was a coup and it was maintaining just the rights that they'd been rebelling against. During the Revolutionary War, the people in, people in the U.S. had been tarring and feathering British judges and riding them out of the town on a rail because those were the people who implemented the most hated parts of British law, which was property law, right? That's what made it possible for people in London to make decisions about the lives of people in the colonies without ever coming to the United States and without being vulnerable in any way for the effect of their decisions. That's why people joined the Constitution, the, the, the army, to fight against the British because they wanted some independence in their lives. Yet, when the Constitution was written, did basically the same thing Indians did. They failed to really pursue independence because they kept the whole system of British property law that was the single most hateful thing to the colonials in the first place. So do you think all the soldiers that fought, you know, under Washington felt betrayed once the Constitution Absolutely was written did. after the Revolutionary yes. War? Yes, and that you can find that in the documentation on the anti-federalists. Oh, really? That is, our government, of course, was found it was the federalists who won because they had the that money, they had the ability to communicate, right. they had the control of the courts, they had the, they had the, they were the prestigious people who were dominant in the colonies. And so they pretty much drowned out. And the they were centered the here in New York City, in the banking of New yes, York City. That's right. Alexander Hamilton and his yes, that's right. his circle. And and that's right. the people that opposed him were from the South in Virginia, right? And that would have been. No, the, they were all, all over the country. There okay. were anti plenty of anti federalists in Massachusetts, for uh -huh. instance, too. Uh -huh. Shays' rebellion in Massachusetts was by the anti federalists for the kinds of reasons I've just been outlined. Okay. And uh, what was the role of Jefferson in this? Because Jefferson, Jefferson was initially sympathetic to the anti-federalists, but then when he realized the amount of power that was available through the imperial system, buying land from 
uh, from France getting the Louisiana Purchase and so on, he adopted the Federalist principle. He did, you yes. think? Yeah. Yes. And but all, um, all of his writing, for instance, about the virtues of the yeoman farmers, and so yeah. or the kind he wanted of an agriculturally based economy, yes. a rural economy, yes. with small farmers. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, at the time of the Constitution, of the people who had actual voting rights, 95% were self-employed. Right. Yeah. Now it's the reverse right. in yeah. the United States. About 5% yeah. of us are self-employed. Right. And the rest of us are not only employed by other people, we're encumbered by debt. We're right. bonded right. wage slaves, unless we're excluded entirely and are unemployed. And the unemployed, the unemployed have not one right that they can exert against any employer. You have no right not to be marginalized in this country, and the Constitution does not give the poor any right at all for any protection against the rich. Instead, Madison, for instance, thought that uh, property was, uh, was something that equalized people, which is flagrantly false. I mean, he thought, well, okay, his possession of property doesn't interfere with anybody else's possession of property. But then he was largely thinking that because there was this huge frontier, so you could always go get more property. This, of course, has not been so since about 1900. Could, could you talk a little bit about the inherent contradiction between our political process, which is a republic or a, quote, democracy, unquote, and the structure of business, which is basically founded, it's antithetical to our democratic system of organizing our society. In other words, businesses are top-down, usually management. Yeah. Uh, the boss can basically dismiss people. It's basically, I won't, you know, I hate to use this word fascism, but it isn't, but it, is. but it, it is. is authoritarian control. Fasc so, fascism is just the modern form of feudalism. That is, businesses operate on the same principles of property law, right? That that the aristocracy ran Britain with. It's the same problem. That so is, would the you characterize it as just has a privilege, no so right? It's authoritarian, top-down yes. management, yes. where the people that work or are employed have very little rights, right? Yes. Except that they belong to a union. But even these rights have been stripped since the mid-80s, following not than, Reagan. Not more than 12 percent of American workers are attached to unions right. anymore, yeah. and those unions all cooperate with management, with very few exceptions. So do you do you see? I mean, let's talk about the impact of a mentality of employment. A type of employment, like when Jefferson and when this country was founded, it was self-employed people living. I mean, trying to well, the electorate, out. not the population. Yeah, yeah. Because wi women, blacks, well, right, okay. young people without right. property. Were Let's just say it was males, yeah. usually uh, white males, own property yeah. and farm, yeah. and they were their own bosses farming. Yeah. Uh, now, as you say, it's the reverse. Ninety-five percent of the people are employed by other people usually by companies or top-down management. What, what's the impact on the mentality of modern humanity by spending a lot of their waking life employed as quote-unquote wage slaves? What do you think that is? What well, it generally renders us unable to think independently because we're all aware of consequences for our, for our employment and of our dependency if we announce any views that are contrary to those of our employers and the people we're indebted to. Right? This is really significant because generally people can't think in very extended ways, as can't develop thoughts very elaborately without conversation. You've got to be able to talk to somebody. You have to have something to reply to. You've got to have something from someone else to think about. So if you can't speak, Right? There are very few people who can develop independent chains of thought. Only extremely introverted people can do that. It's a very small part of the population. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's crippling to people, and it's crippling to the political abilities of people. That is, it's destroying our ability to represent ourselves. Great. That's a very uh, perceptive comment. Thank you. Thank you. I, I kind of agree with that. That there's been a sea change in the American mentality, uh, and it's led to apathy and passivity, and people just accept what they're given or are grateful for a job and don't realize that maybe 
you know, they could have. I wouldn't say so much apathy as passivity, because passivity because people They're scared. are dependent on other people. They're scared. They're scared. Yeah. yeah. You They're know, scared you, of losing what little they have. If you try to think independently, have. then yeah. you know you're crippling your chances at making a living. Yeah. Right. Right. Unless you're artistically inclined and go into uh, movie if, making or something. Even if you're artistically inclined, you're dependent upon an audience. That's true. You, you've yeah. got to be able to sell it to somebody. Yeah. And most artists are only able to sell to the rich. Right, right. The people who've got the loose money. I mean, you've got 2% of the people in the country who own 50% of the wealth. Right. And meanwhile, the bottom 40% of the country has only 0.3% of the wealth. Right, so if you imagine a room 100 feet by 100 feet, one person draws a line across the middle and tells the other 49 if there are 50 people in the room, you want to touch anything on my side of the room, first you pay me. Right? Meanwhile, you've got, if there are 50 people, 20 of them standing against the back wall, 10 of those people with only one by one foot each and tw 10 of the people with one by two feet each. So, and then you, you create this whole police structure to keep those people in line because it's impossible to live that way. That is, you don't have, yeah. you don't have the access to resources that they need in, in order to live. And so you make a big deal about, you know, putting them in prison and trying them and so on. Do you on. think that's the explanation why America has the largest uh, Absolutely. Prison population Absolutely. in the world, Absolutely. more than China or because anywhere. Because we have the we have the most stratified class system in the developed world. But we don't admit it. Right. Because when you bring this up, anything yes. about income disparity, everybody yeah. says oh, class warfare. You know. We have we yeah. have a myth of yeah. equality, but yeah. it's just equality of manners. Yes. With equality is nothing of substance in I this get country. It. You don't have any quality of rights. You don't have any quality of income. You don't have equality of, of possibilities of life. There is less social mobility in the United States than in any European country now. Is that true? Yes, wow. that's true. Wow. I mean, we're all fed the myth that we're the land of opportunity. We are not the land of opportunity. You want opportunity, go to Europe. Well, how do you explain people living in one reality, which is absolute sort of truthful reality, but believing that they live in another reality. That, isn't that a, sort of like living Actually, in a bubble of the illusion? The educational system and the media. Oh, corporate I mean, owned. Yeah, because we, I mean, we call this crap communication, but it's yeah. all one way. Yeah. You, you know, all, we're fed all of this stuff, yeah. and meanwhile we stop talking to each other. In, well, in 1933, yeah. when Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to office, he was told that if he didn't reform immediately, he had a revolution on his hands. The reason for that was that people communicated with each other very well then. People used to sit out on their porches every night and talk to their neighbors. We don't do that. We sit glued to the tube and we're just fed this stuff, and so we don't find out that other people are experiencing actually the same kind of thing we are in, in contradistinction to what we're being told they experience and we experience on the television. Well, you know, I think that's watch. very true, but I, I, for the first time in my life, experienced talking to strangers and listening to what they had to say down at what they call Zocotti Park, what, what we call, the insiders call, you know, Liberty Square Plaza Park, yes. you know, and uh, it was really amazing to hear people just discourse on yes. their opinions, and it was just right. people talking to each other. It was like uh, the yep. dam broke, the dam broke, yes. and, and the flood of words was released from perfect strangers, yes. and I found that really accelerating. I've never heard, I, I mean, I've never been experienced to that, not even in college, yeah. you know, right. just people, and I, you know, Right. People you wouldn't think would be knowledgeable, yes. like, you know, janitors and stuff would have really firm opinions yes. right on target, you know. Right. I mean, people that didn't even go to college had right. pretty much a very accurate sort of view that right. agreed with me, and, you know, I'm pretty well read, but I'm not going to pat myself on the back, but I read a lot, and, and yet these people were right on target, you know, yes. and they just cut through all the BS, you yes. know. And so I found that Liberty uh, Square, it was really like what I always would say, it's like the Athenian uh, 
Acropolis, where all everybody met yes. um, to talk, you know, yes. and that was democracy Viagra. about the, yeah about 2,500 yes. years yes. ago, you know. So yes. it was really philosophers were there and and yes. all kinds of people, and it was really stimulating to be exposed yes. to all that. Yes. I probably learned more in my seven weeks down there yes. than I have in my whole life, mm -hmm. and I just spent all day just listening and yes. you know yes. it was fascinating. Right. Yeah. Wonderful thing. Yeah, and I'm, yes. I, one reason I recorded so much down there yes. is to preserve this because I kind of had an inkling it couldn't continue. I thought maybe the winter would shut it down, the weather, yes. uh, but as it turned out, the authorities shut it down, and uh, that's what one reason I just recorded a lot down there of what actually happened: people talking, groups, because it it, it will prove to subsequent okay. historians. And there were a lot of other people. I wasn't the only one. I think it was the most photographed piece of Earth on the planet for a couple of months there. But uh, I did my best to preserve people like you talking. And I'm doing it right now because I think you have something really interesting to say and uh, about what formed the intellectual framework of our, of our Constitution and, and how we end up where we are today with vast income discrepancies between the majority and the well, small minority. It's important to mention the law of diminishing returns. Yeah. The law of diminishing returns, which is an unchallenged piece of economic theory going back about 250 years, yeah. right, states that successive consumptions of anything yield progressively less satisfaction or benefit, right? So that, say, if you have 12 pieces of chocolate and you got 12 kids, the way that you'll get the most benefit out of the chocolate is by giving each kid one piece, right? right? Because if you give any kid a second piece and someone else none, that second piece is not worth as much as the first piece to the person who eats it, okay? now. This is true of everything, including money. And so the more money you have, the less good it does you per unit, and the less you have, the more good it does you per unit. When you have a couple of hundred dollars a year, thousand dollars a year, you double your income, your welfare almost doubles because this is on a logarithmic scale. Whereas according to the formula that Amartya Sen developed for the World Bank for its gross domestic product index to express the law of diminishing returns, once you're over $40,000 a year per person in purchasing power parity dollars, in other words, dollars equivalent anywhere on earth, right, um, the, the benefit that you get is nil. That is, money over $40,000 a year per person only allows its possessor to manipulate and control other people, to hire people to do things that they would never do on their own to satisfy themselves or in accord with their own perceptions. Right? Or non-essential spending. Absolutely. You really don't need that product, right. but you buy it because you have the money, so why That's not? Right. Yeah. It creates luxuries. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So that essentially, as the larger part of the wealth of the richest 2%, is wasted. That is, it's just it's just gone to the economy. It's only being used to control other people. It's purely anti-democratic. So first off, most of our wealth we don't have access to. Very few people have access to it. Half of our wealth, right, is being controlled by just two percent of the people. And so that's not producing any good for the rest of us. Okay. It's as if you take the country and you split it in half and you say, okay, six million people live west of the Mississippi and 294 million people live east of it. Okay? Then if you look at the poorest people, right? Say you look at you look at the poorest 20%, well, that would actually be something like 62.4 million of us. And if all property were real property, would just land. That would mean that those 62 million people would live, need to live in an area between the size of Delaware and Connecticut, right? And that the rest of the country would be protected from them by the police, because of course, 
you can't reasonably live in that area. They'd have a population density equal to the density of Hong Kong and Singapore, right? And so we, we demand absolutely impossible things of our poorest people. And then when they break down, we blame them. But the reason that they're having a hard time, they have no access to physical resources. They can't get educated, they can't get health, they can't get decent housing, can't get decent clothing. You know, and so the problems of their lives are primarily being caused by the poverty they're being blamed for. Now they can't get out of that poverty because if you want to create a job, and I used to write grant proposals uh, for India and Nepal, uh, you have to have at least one year's income in capital in order to create a job, right? Um, so if the people in this country are skating along on less than one month's income, so half of us have less than one twelfth of what we would need to create a job, and yet the rich try to humiliate them and quite effective at doing that, telling them that the problem with their lives is that they're not entrepreneurs, when they physically can't be. Huh. I just have yeah. atrocious hypocrisy and an awful meanness. Again, as you know, we build prisons for the poorest people in the country, but blue collar crime causes only one one hundredth as much loss as white collar crime in the US. The only time anybody ever goes to jail for white collar crime, it's like if they rob somebody even richer than they are, as Bernie Madoff did. Right? That we just let white collar crime go. Speaking of white collar crime, offensive. are you aware that most major banks engage in tens of billions of dollars of money laundering for drug cartels every year? All of them, absolutely all of them. There was an article in 2010 about this, uh, and not one bank executive, they've been caught, they've been caught, they're fined, but they don't admit guilt, and not one executive has ever gone to prison for this. Laundering, we're talking, Culminatively, in a decade, over a hundred billion dollars in cartel money, drug cartel money. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. are you aware of that? Yeah. yeah. Speaking of white collar crime, yeah. in other words, that's why on the back of my shirt here yeah. is uh, the word bankster. Did uh -huh. you ever? Yes, you, you I saw know the that, word right? Yes. Here, hold that. Right, okay. Just so. All right. Yeah. Bankster. Bankster's yeah. get bailed out. Yeah. Ninety-nine percent, we the people get sold yeah, out. We the people is the yeah. you know. Declaration of Independence, but anyway, yes. Constitution. But anyway, uh, the reason I have this on here is yeah. they are really criminals. Uh, they do launder yes. blood money because yeah. the cartels kill a lot of people. Think of Mexico, where basically they've adopted uh, terrorism mesh methods of mass executions, beheadings, yeah. uh, kidnappings of family yeah. members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Torture of those kidnapped members to yeah. get money. So it, it's a cancer, you know, and and yet the major banks, it's documented, are laundering these billions and billions and billions of dollars the cartels make illegally, thanks to the drug laws uh, making, well, some you know, are far worse than others. Yeah, once in Florida, are really, really bad. CIA uses that too, by the way. Yeah, really. Yeah. Right. I don't know. We're there for the CIA's drug money. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know that. Really? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I just think it's kind of a scandal when we're putting people that, you know, rob banks for a few thousand bucks, you know, yes, in jail is. for, I think it's 20 years you can get, but then, or 10 years, it's a major felony. In, in Texas, you can be put away for life for yeah. marijuana. Oh, really? Possession. Still? Yes. Yeah, yes. is that true? Oh, right. Well, there are people who were in jail for over 20 years Wow. in Texas just for having an ounce of marijuana. Unreal. Yes, it is. It, is and it destroys families, of course. I mean, oh, it, yeah. it's not just the people in jail who suffer, their entire families do. What do you, what do you think, uh, just, you know, getting a little bit off, you know, are you aware that the Obama administration last week has uh, endorsed a law yes. uh, against, uh, well, allowing the government to basically take American citizens into custody yes. without, the police state. Yeah, without charges and with uh, no trial? Yes. Uh, are you right. aware of that? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion of that? Act. Why would why would uh, the Obama administration actually do something more oppressive than the Bush administration? Well, primarily because they're worried about things like Occupy Wall Street. Oh, you think? Yeah, sure. You think I got an sure. X on my back? Well, look, I'm going I to mean, be one of the first ones well, to be made, I mean, identified as an intellectual, quote-unquote, terrorist or some bullshit? Well, the, the Defense yeah. Authorization Act is yeah. a tacit confession yeah. that Occupy Wall Street has the right enemy. As you see, there was Occupy Washington, which is saying, okay, Washington's the problem, it's the government. But really, the problem is that Wall Street controls Washington. Yeah, right. And so the money. O yeah. Occupy Wall Street. You know, it, it, see, look, Thomas Thomas Hobbes, you know, said in, in Leviathan, one of the yeah. basic pieces of political yeah, yeah, theory, yeah. right, that governments rule by force and fraud. And so the basic fraud was that this country is a country of equals, and that it's not run by and for and to benefit the rich. Now, that fraud isn't working well anymore. People are seeing through it since 2008 when you had such massive transfers of wealth, of tax money. Oh right, yeah, unreal. To, to the banks, Yeah, yeah. right? And so people, the, the, the basic fraud of the government, its preference for the rich and its service of the rich, is becoming visible to everybody. Well, it's totally visible okay. now. Well, the thing is, if governments rule by force and fraud, and they lose the option of fraud, then they fall back on force. Got it. That's why they've made us a police state by implementing, you know, the well, defense Well, this is a act. very dangerous law, because for the first time, I mean, you already had Obama authorized the killing of an American citizen, that Muslim guy yes. who was going on the internet with all yes. his sermons and yes. inspiring uh, the fundamentalists right. there, the terrorists. So they got rid of him with that drone attack. Wasn't it Yemen? Yeah, Yemen or Somalia yeah, or something. Yemen. One of those. So you already had, that was kind of a precedent, right? Yes. And that was what, about two months ago, I guess? Wasn't it? A little it? earlier. But I mean, that, this... So that now the they're sort of managed. retroactively legalizing, yes. uh, I mean, the Times had an article after they did that guy, you know, and killed him, saying, well, actually, they did run it by the Justice Department lawyers, and they okayed it. It was okay. They also okayed torture. Well, John, was you? it the Justice Department, or was you? it you, you? and that you? guy uh, Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, yeah. he's a professor now. He oh. got actually yeah. awarded a, uh, I think he's a judge now. He got he got promoted Steve up to the yeah yeah the second court of appeals or so. After he wrote that, you know, okaying torture, he got promoted up. You know, rewarded. You can find somebody. Yeah, and then they got that Lou guy who uh, was teaching over there at uh, Berkeley. Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. But um, he didn't really get promoted up. He just sort of got shifted to a nice, safe, tenured position. He, he was in the attorney general. Office. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so. I mean, what do you think is going to happen with this new law they just put into effect? They gave up the fraud part. They, the, the Wizard of Oz has been revealed with the levers behind the curtain. So now they're going to depend on force to to yeah. sort of coerce people. Right. Like what, me? Are they trying to get me, sure. you think? they want to scare you. Yeah. Yeah, the whole, okay. the whole thing. I mean, they want to rule by fear now, the same way as the Soviet Union used And to. so in theory, with this new law, if it's passed, I don't think it's yeah. been passed yet. No, it has. Oh, it has been Both passed. Both houses have passed it, and Obama already said that he would sign it. Oh, really? The only, yeah, the only thing that he wanted was yeah. to be assured that the president would maintain the right to take people out of the military system, oh. right, and put him into the civilian system. Uh, but that's his right anyway, as yeah. commander in chief of the armed forces. Is this for foreign so combatants? He, he just, is this foreign combatant thing? No, that's where for they US classify citizens U.S. citizens, but they have to be US a foreign citizens combatant citizens. or something? Uh, no, no. The US, no. Well, there's another set of laws about foreign combatants yeah. who are in mufti, that is who who aren't in uniform. Oh, okay. The idea being that... Yeah, yeah, they have no say, military say, rights. An Iraqi civilian, right. right, is really one of the enemy, and he's worse than a regular enemy because he's not wearing his uniform when he may never have had one because he's really a civilian. I get it. Right, so it's just, it's, it's all So the Alice laws of war, the talk. Geneva Accords, really yeah. don't technically govern somebody like that fighting in civilian right. clothes, well, they just, using, uh, yes. like, what do they call it, asymmetric warfare or something, where they, you know, basically terrorism right. or whatever. Well, they just, want it, they just want to be able to go after people who 
who are not part of any formal military. Right, right. People like Al Qaeda. Like Al Qaeda. I mean, Al Qaeda almost like, could be classified as a like the mafia, almost, couldn't they? Like a criminal organization. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I mean, that was wasn't that the argument that they should just be trying these people in criminal court because they're criminals? Of course. Yeah. Well, but they so, didn't. They we, went we, for the military after, in after prison. After September 11th. Yeah. As in the first talk that George Bush gave after September 11th, right. he said a great crime has been committed. Yeah. He never repeated that because his staff, you know, had to tell him, look. If you call it a crime, then the appropriate thing to do is to sign on to the International Criminal Court, yeah, like 107 right. other countries have done. Yeah, right. They don't want to sign on to that because that would make it possible for the court to prosecute uh, American That's officials. That's fascinating. Yeah, and right. he also called for, so, quote unquote, a new crusade. And that just lit up well, the Arab uh, world. Right. Remember that? And they said, uh oh, no, 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 don't say that word. Has right. very bad historical connotations for for the Muslim world, you know. Sure. But he did call, I mean, he made those two two linguistic yeah. verbal errors, yeah. and they, they never repeated that word crusade or a huge crime, yeah. a crime. Uh, so I was unaware they just recently passed, the two houses passed this, yes. huh? Yes. And so technically now, as soon as the president signs it, anybody who is a threat to the government? Well, anyone that the military deems to be a threat. They don't have to present that person to the Well, luckily, I'm a pacifist. To a I'm, a, I'm a pacifist, and I'm nonviolent, and I'm a vegetarian. Yeah, but you see, And uh, hopefully, to, I don't get classified well, as to mili right. being but a threat to, to mili anybody. Militarists, you see, don't believe this yeah. fundamentally. Uh -huh. They don't really believe that it, anybody is a pacifist because they know that it's true of themselves that they'll always strike out and be willing to strike out against people when, from time to time. So they, they project their other people too. They project their own mentality yeah. on other people. Right. And they just assume people are right. naturally violent or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, there's 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 political theory that goes behind it. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, for instance, the reason that he called, you know, life and liberty inalienable rights was that he meant you could not prevent a person from acting on those rights. That's meaning you couldn't alienate him from those rights because so long as he had a control over his own body, he could seek his freedom, right, or try to preserve his life. That's why they were inalienable. And so, the, you know, the militarists who believe that everybody's potentially violent are really relying on the same basic doctrine because that's what underlies the concept of inalienability. Interesting. It's founded on violence. Huh. Yeah. That the desire for equality arises from envy rather than injury. Now, I don't believe the envy theory. Uh, I think that the desire, the desire for equality arises from injury. Okay? That is, when you don't have, when you're particularly relative poverty itself is injurious yeah okay that is if you take if you if you take two countries right the country that has the higher Gini coefficient or the bigger difference between the rich and the poor will have more violent crime have more incarceration more mental illness more drug use more teenage pregnancy Right? More obesity, lower test scores, uh, less uh, freedom and power for women. Right? All of those things are directly correlated with the level of inequality. It's quite obvious, of course, that extreme inequality is injurious to the poor. But there are two British epidemiologists, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, written a book called um, the spirit level, which in British just means a carpenter's level, right? Why equal societies almost always do better. And they've spent 30 years examining the statistics of the 21 richest countries and the 50 U.S. states and have found very high correlation between inequality and all of the social complaints that we have. That is, more equal countries are more peaceful, they're saner, they're happier, they have higher, 
higher test scores, more skills. As the way that we run this country, we deny most people a decent education so that they can't do things. Or they, they go into they debt for hundreds of thousands of right. dollars yes, like absolutely. these young people in this generation are doing. Absolutely, and the purpose of doing that is to get this, to force them once they graduate only to work for the rich who can pay them enough for them to pay back their loans. So that they effectively lose their independence as adults, they lose their capacity to make moral choices about their career, and they're swamped by this system in which they got to the pay that debt everything. back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And now, right now, student debt is more than credit card debt. It's more than a trillion dollars. Yeah. And you can't uh, default on it. It's yeah. undefaultable. It's you're born and you live till you die right. paying it off, you know? Right. Huh. Well, it's a very cool system. I mean, mostly what the rich have to do with their money is figure out ways to get more money. Well, and let me ask you a question. Uh, what went through my mind just a second ago as you were talking was, you know, why, if this exists, these statistics you just pointed out by these two authors uh, have been published and everybody knows you have a healthier society, lower crime, higher education level, more happy people, less of all the social ills. Isn't it in the benefit of the richest of course it is. To, to promote actually income equality because it will be a better society, safer for them too. That is, if you, know? you, have, if you have, the say, say you're a, you have a million dollars yeah. and you have the choice between doubling your income right. and moving to a more equal country, right. if you want to extend your life, yeah. you're better advised to give up some of your money and go to a country where people are more equal because there's less stress, you're more likely to live long than by getting more money. But why are the rich then so ignorant of what's in their own best interest? Because they don't read any more than anybody else, and they don't think seriously. They're too busy grabbing things and controlling us. So they haven't really thought through their position in the system and, and maybe right. how consolidation to, of wealth. You know what they call this, by the way? If you've inherited money, yeah. why do you need to? Yeah. By the way, have you read The Black Swan by that guy Taleb, who's a... A little bit. Uh, he was a protege, protege of um, Mandelbrot, yeah. who invented yeah. fractional yeah. geometry, yeah. which is currently engulfing yeah. kind of our understanding of how the world is structured. So it might be a holographic universe uh, where it is Wait, a mathematically it, based fractal. universe. Fractals, fractals yeah. yeah. Anyway, this guy Taub, who was a yeah. disciple or a protege yeah. of Mandelbrot, wrote a book called The Black Swan. Yeah. And in there, he talked about something called the Matthew effect. Uh, oh. There's a passage in the Gospel of Matthew where, where I think Jesus says, to them that have shall be given more, and to them that have uh, not shall little, be taken away. What little they have shall be taken well, away. Well, you know, yes. that, that's called the Matthew effect. I don't know okay. if it's been codified officially in economic theory as, say, the bad money drives out good money or moral has all these technical terms. Well, which it's are, obviously true the way a capitalist system functions. Yeah. Because you only sell things, right. you sell things to people who will give you the highest price. Sure. I mean, Amartya Sen wrote a book called Poverty and Famines. What's his it, name? Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winning okay. Indian economist. Ah. Uh, okay, at Harvard. Yeah. What, Right. So, he, and now I think he's a doctor at Cambridge. Okay. But he wrote a book called Poverty and Famines, in which he examined eight famines. And he found that in every single famine, the cause was not lack of food. The was cause political. was speculation. Yeah, yeah. That is, the people who had the wholesalers of the food, right, did not want to sell the food at a price that the poor, the people who were well, I heard about that, the, like the potato famine That's of right. Ireland, yes. when uh, when uh, Russell was prime minister, I believe, was caused by hoarding. Uh, and they ha actually had on That's the right. docks of uh, Dublin yes. uh, full warehouses full of uh, potatoes right. being That's shipped right. to England, you know, right. while the population of Ireland starved. So I, I, I've read about that. I'm yeah. familiar. I wasn't aware Sen, that that... Sen's study is quite uh -huh. systematic and yeah. quite conclusive. That is, famine is not caused by lack of food, it's caused by speculation. And so a capitalist system rewards people who seek the highest the, the highest uh, price 
right yeah, for the but thing. How do you, how do you, they can only get that from people who have the money. So but, it favors the people but, who have the money but and destroys how do you people who are marginal. How do you reverse the Matthew effect? I mean, how do you, the snowball rolls down the hill, it gathers more snow. Rich people go through time, they gather more money. How do you strip that snowball down so there, it melts there, a little? There are or several how, ways. First, how do I mean, you do it? So how would you as, recommend it? So far as food goes, you have to subsidize necessities. It is necessary to, to put price limits on necessities and to distinguish strictly between things that are really necessary and things that aren't. But in general, equalization of wealth and income can be achieved in two radically different ways. Tell me. The one is by redistribution of wealth, and the other is by not, not having different salaries or wages in the first place. For instance, if you look at Vermont and New Hampshire, they have practically equal distributions of wealth, but they obtained them in completely different ways. New Hampshire was a state of small towns in which nobody had much more money than anybody else because there was no way to get that. That is, you had, you, you had a, a little store in a small town, your market was going to be only so large, you could only get a certain amount of money, okay? Whereas Vermont got its equality by redistribution of wealth. Vermont has, has some of the best health care in the country through the state government, right, of, of any place in the United States. And so you can always, you can either make laws say that there is a necessary bridge between the rich and the poor, say, in income. Like, you could make a law that Sam Pizzagatti recommends in his book, Read and Good, and his uh, web uh, emails are called Too Much, right? He says, well, you, should have, you need a law that says that the head of a company cannot earn more than 10 times as much as the least paid employee. Right? And now that it's 410 times. And back in the 50s, it was oh, 23 times. I think it's even more than that. I, there, there 410 was one, last or 420. Figure I saw was one, one person was getting $463 million in one year. One year's income. No, this is the average CEO. CEO. The average oh, the CEO, average CEO makes yeah. 410 but, or 420 times the average but, but, but employee of a, a factory. You have to have a cutoff point. Yeah. That is, you see, the problem is the Fortune 500 companies, they have, they employ only 10% of American workers, but they make 75% of the profit, Wow! primarily because they have their production plants in poor countries where they can get people to work for dirt wages, right? The, the indigenous economy of the United States consists of about 6 million companies, okay, that average less than 50 workers each, but they only make 25% of the profit, and so, they don't have the loose change with which to hire lobbyists and corporate lawyers and to lobby, you know, to lobby Washington and get regulations that they want out of out of Washington and buy campaigns. So that's why the Fortune 500 companies control Washington because they've got all that loose money. Uh, what happened recently in Iowa, yeah. you know, they instituted very high corporate taxes in Iowa yeah. recently yeah. Uh, to make up for a budget deficit. Yeah. Then, guess what happened? The big companies in Iowa yeah. threatened to leave the state and they were given, uh, they were given because of their connections and their, and their high profile and their sheer enormousness, yeah. they were given tax holidays on this new law. So then, as an editorial writer wrote, it's only the small businesses of Iowa that are going to be paying that higher corporate tax because all the big companies located in Iowa got yeah. exempted from those high taxes by threatening to leave the state. Right. Uh, isn't that amazing? So well, what you just said is right on the yeah. money. That's exactly yeah. what happened recently. Well, yeah, that, exactly. That happened, for instance, in, in, in the yeah. mayoral elections yeah. of Atlanta, Georgia, and Chicago. Yeah. You know, Atlanta, Georgia got its first black mayor, and everyone expected that this would lead to equalization of whites and yeah. blacks Keep and dreaming, of right? in, in Atlanta. Keep Instead, dreaming. Instead, the factory owners just moved out right outside of town, set up shop yeah. in the suburbs, yeah. Yeah. right? And so didn't have to pay the taxes, and so Atlanta became impoverished. Right. And so they, they do this. And Chicago, do, you mentioned huh? Chicago. And Chicago, yeah, Mayor Washington. Right, that's a lot of the 
people thought there was going to be some really right, right. substantial improvement of the inner city in Chicago. It didn't happen because the, the companies just move out. Right. They're free to move. You vote with your feet, I guess. And That's they, why it uh, takes federal legislation. Yeah. But you see, it's exactly in the federal government that the, that the Fortune 500 are strongest. Speaking, That's they concentrate there. I hear you. Speaking of uh, just corporation power, influence yeah. of government, what do you think about the recent Supreme Court decision which gave companies uh, First Amendment rights, which were applied Citizens to people? United. Yeah, Citizens United. What do you think about that? Why would the Supreme Court do that? Of the people of the country. I mean, this is an obviously asinine decision, which shows you that at this point, the the Supreme Court is composed primarily of political hacks from the Republican Party. But that's so bizarre. They're all very well educated in the Ivy League, Princeton, Yale, Harvard. How could people that are supposed to be so well versed in constitutional law end up giving First Amendment rights to corporations? Well, first off, because access to elite schools primarily depends on class. That is, when you look, you look at SATs and GREs and yeah, all of that, yeah, yeah. and primarily what they're measuring is different kinds of cultural knowledge, which the upper class always has more of than lower classes because they have much wider contacts. When you're in a lower class, you know the people in your neighborhood. Sure, right. When you're in the upper class, you know people all over the country and often sure. all around the world. Yeah. And so, and you you have journals and all kinds of information. Right. And so, you know things like IQ tests and so on primarily affect class. But and how so could the Supreme Court, from this uh, ruling class or intellectual class, well educated, they should know better? What is? Why would they make such a decision? I mean, because they're serving the rich. They, they are. They come from wealthy backgrounds. They believe in the rich. They think that they, the Constitution tells them that there's no right that a poor person deserves to have against the rich, that the rich don't have obligations to the poor. The only thing that has ever protected the poor in any way in the Constitution is interpretation of the welfare clause, which doesn't say anything specific. I mean, there's no equivalent, say, to the protection that blacks get because of the phrase badges of slavery and so on and, and what's in the contents of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Oh, is that in there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It says, it says that, that, in other words, if your ancestors have been slaves, then you're entitled to compensatory benefits. Oh, really? That. I didn't right. know that. Huh. Well, yeah. So I'm ignorant of that. No. There's constitutional protection. But they never enacted for race. They never enacted huh? that, right? No. What do you mean? I mean, they never, if that's in our Constitution. The 14th, the 13th, 14th, and 15th but, Amendments but were enacted no around 1870. Yeah, but no social programs were started based on that, were there? Well, the Reconstruction... But that was a failure, Reconstruction. Uh, re, yes, yeah, so I'm saying Reconstruction crushed most of that. Initially, there was a great surge of energy after the Civil War, yeah. until about 18... Is dying out between 1875 yeah, and 1877. Yeah, there's a big backlash. Big backlash. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that you know, but so it, it, was, failed. it was an attempt. Yeah, it was an attempt, but it, it failed. No, but legally, it didn't entirely fail, because during the civil rights movement, people had the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to appeal to. Oh, I see. Okay. You see, Martin, Martin Luther King, it, you know, he never lost a court case, and the and the the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, Charles, first Charles Hamilton Houston, and and then uh, Thurgood Marshall. They didn't lose cases. Thurgood Marshall never lost a case out of something 70 some cases that he brought to the Supreme Court. He had the he was the only lawyer with a pure 100 percent record. Wow. And so. They, that is, the, the civil rights movement often defied the orders of state courts that were enforcing Jim Crow laws. And state so law, right. They never defied the Well, that was the, the old thing, state rights. Court. That was state rights, yeah. So, so there's, I mean, the, the civil rights movement got substantial uh, support. A hundred years later. A hundred years, well, 90 right, years right. later, But yeah. the, problem, the problem is there's no equivalent for the poor. There's no equivalent in the Constitution. Yeah, you're free to be poor. You're free to fail as a yeah. poor person, but not if you're a rich person. Yeah, then Madison, you get bailed out. Madison and then you get bailed out with socialist economic policies. Right. Yeah. They socialize losses 
but they privatize profits. I mean, for the financial companies. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of interesting, don't you think? How convenient it is for them. Well, look, yeah. if you're going to defend property, yeah, look, there there are there are no laundry lists in law or politics. Yeah. There are only priorities. Yeah. So if you're going to compare property rights to human rights, you're either going to have to make human rights precede property rights or vice versa. Right. If you choose property rights, that means human rights come somewhere between second and last. This country has chosen property rights, and so we don't enforce human rights. You look at the records of human rights treaty observance, compare Western Europe to the United States, the record in Western Europe is around 99% observance. In the United States now, it's well below 90%, along with Britain, which is the second lowest. And that's the United Nations country. figures, I guess? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah I've figures, looked at those occasionally. Like it's kind of shocking. Charles America's Humana. like... Yeah. Yes, yeah. keep track of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've cho we chose property rights. Now, obviously, if you're going to defend property rights first, you're going to be defending primarily the rights of the people who have the property rights, which means the rich. Who own that's, something. That's right. Or the older generation right. who've been on Earth longer and have amassed more property because they've had the opportunity through living longer to be more successful. Right. So you're actually defending the older generation against the more vulnerable yes. because newer, younger generation, yes. basically, right? Yes. And Social Security is really a transfer of wealth we from the younger generation to the older retired generation, right. saying, who are already more wealthy anyway because they've had a whole lifetime to be successful, you know? Yes. So you can look at it in a, as generational in, inequality. Well, there's a much bigger difference between the rich and the poor than there is between generations. Right. It's much larger. Sure. And most of the generational difference that exists now exists because of Social Security and pensions. So right, right. What do you it's think of... It's uh, quite fragile. Yeah. What do you think of Thomas Jefferson's famous letter to James Madison in which he says, the earth belongs in usufruit Usufru. to the living. Usufruit. U-S-U-F-R-U-C-T. Yes. Meaning, meaning... Uh, custodianship, stewardship, wise management of a resource. What do you think about that expression? Are you it's familiar a, with a his... It's classic anti-federalist doctrine. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. But he, he formulated that with Lafayette yes. and Tom Paine yes. during the French Revolution with a doctor, Dr. Uh, Gott, I think his name was, who was treating his broken wrist. Those uh, four gentlemen came up with that. But what do you think about that as a phrase, Yusufru? Uh, generational, generational justice, division of wealth. You have to give me a sentence to answer. I, I well, I'm just know what, okay. I don't know how to answer to a phrase. Okay, I I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, just yeah. I thought I you know. Just need a proposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. Is, well, I think something's true or false. Do you think anything could be? Do you think that's true? Let's go with that. I, I don't know what a phrase. Phrases aren't true. Okay. Only propositions. Well, there's an argument based on that. The earth belongs in usufruit to the. Uh, you're familiar with the legal term usufruit yes. from the colonial. So, obviously. So, does do you think that term? You do you think that word? As you rarely read it now. I mean, it was a 17th century it legal. Just means anything that comes out of the earth. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that's produced from the earth. So you don't. Do you, so that was Thomas Jefferson's agrarian philosophy well, the is, of the he, small farmer. Does he think that all people deserve an equal share of, of the earth. access of the earth's resources? And he did. I believe people that. Well, he wasn't consistent about it. He may have said things like that yeah. from time to time, but that's radically different from the property law system we have. I know, but I don't know if he's responsible for that, you know. Well, if... When they wrote the Constitution, wasn't he in um, in Paris? He signed it. Yeah, with... But, no, but uh, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that, yeah. see, look, if everybody had access to an equal share of the world's resources, the world would be a much more peaceful place because most wars are fought about access to resources. Yeah, they've always been over resources. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. That's so for we, sure. If we, if we One country wants another country's yeah. treasures, basically. Right. But now, you know, with the internet, everything is intellectual property rights, a lot of it. And you get a lot of industrial espionage, like they just discovered the Chinese hackers 
We're going into the American Chamber of Commerce website and basically have been a looting it for probably a year, but it was just revealed to the public uh, yesterday. So that's intellectual uh, no, I, warfare. I, I, I mean, they were stealing yeah. all the membership records of the American Chamber of Commerce. I assume also in the Asia uh, basin there, in the Asian uh, well, I don't, I don't division. Know the, I don't know the ratio yeah. between intellectual right. property rights and other, other kinds of property Well, what's rights. happening is people What's going on is countries like China are basically indulging in engaging in, in industrial espionage or Absolutely. intellectual thievery uh, right. and uh, getting away with it. And now, you know, like yesterday it was just revealed, uh, they've known about it for months. The FBI yeah. notified wait, the American wait, Chamber. Wait, wait a minute, slow, yeah. slow down. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, now yeah. warfare is not invasions of foreign countries that take what they got. Warfare now is invasions well, you're just of computer using the systems. Word meta, you're you using know? the word metaphorically. Yeah. I mean, look. No, the, the, we now have wait a, a, minute, a military. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Please. <laughs> okay. Me, yeah, okay? yeah. The, the question of intellectual property rights, right. you know, the virtue of them, whether they should be maintained. Well, what, do you, so what do you think about what, that? I'm trying to tell you. Okay, okay, I shut up. It depends up. very much on what kind of intellectual property you're talking about. Okay. For instance, American companies have put a patent on the neem tree in India. They say they own all rights to the tree, whereas the neem tree has been used by Indians for thousands of years. You know, that is, there are, there are, the problem is that the intellectual property right routine of the World Trade Organization gives corporations abilities that destroy the rights, for instance, of, of indigenous people, traditional rights, and so on. Okay? That's amazing, so, isn't it? Well, yes, it's amazing. They can amazing. actually patent a living That's right. organism That's that already has existed for That's millions right. of years. That's right. That's right. And they've also patented the human... DNA known, right? I mean, how, didn't they do that too? Yeah. Haven't they patented that? I, I'm not sure if they've said that. I, I, I think they have. I'm not sure, but, you know. Well, there'll be a lot of different ways of patenting it. Maybe it was invalidated, but I know when they first, you know, did the sequence, numbering, I don't know how many billions of bits of, uh, I, I think they p tried to patent it, but I'm not, I don't know if it held up. I'm not sure. But that means your own DNA is not owned by you. It's owned by well, I, whoever I, I, I patented it. I have to it. read a patent. I don't know whether that's yeah. so or not. You see, they could be patenting something like like the the ability to formulate a gene. No, they were they were, when it first. Remember when they first sequenced it about 15 well, I, I years agree, ago? But I can't talk about they that. didn't even know what they were patenting it. They didn't know the functions of the genes they were patenting, but they but did it anyway just to get ownership of them. Then it turned out that 90, what is it, 95 or 98 percent of our DNA is actually useless uh, rubbish. It's yeah. been discarded over yeah, time and just stayed in there. Yeah. But they actually patented all the rubbish in there because they couldn't recognize, they didn't know the functions. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't yeah. know the details. But that was like 10, 15, 20 years ago when they first sequenced it. There was that, anyway, it doesn't matter. What's your opinion just on what we've been talking about, about intellectual property rights of DNA or, or, or corporate patenting of life forms. Well, it's what, that is one consequence of that regime is a whole lot of people committing suicide. In instance, India? Yeah, for instance, yeah, the, the, but that's, the, rights, the rights that Monsanto has to different crops and to, that use, you know, round out ready and all of that kind of thing, the insecticides and so on. Is they they sell these seeds to Indian farmers, telling them they'll get a much higher yield, and then they prevent the farmers from returning to any of their previous years. So as soon as the farmer has a bad year and is not able to Due purchase to more of their seeds, yeah, right. he's not allowed to use the seeds he has either. So this is why you know. Because of why? Like why is that? People who killed them because that's part of the contract. A hundred thousand people, yes, have, farmers, have committed suicide over in this. India. Yes. Because they lose the right because to farm. Because they lose the right to use their indigenous. Really, a hundred thousand. Yes. Wow. You yes. were over in India recently. I lived, I lived there for seven years. Wow. And then two and, years and in you, Nepal. Wow. I was not aware the figure was so high. Yes. So, wow. That's uh. That's a bloodbath. Arundhati Roy. It's almost like about genocide. Vandana Shiva. 
What is it? Arundhati Roy and Vandana Shiva write about it. I mean, I knew about it because I, you know, would go through Indian villages. One of my family knew how people would commit suicide. They, they, uh, they would use, make a tea out of the leaves of the Gandharapulu plant and uh, kill themselves and their families. It's very well known. Ganda Putu pine? Presumably that has not been patented as a poison yet. Though, God, what a great idea. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's big okay. purple flower. And so, do you like think, and, and do yeah. you think this, this modern property right, intellectual property right, has its basis in your expertise, which is the Anglo-Saxon tradition of legal uh, property rights well, developed look, under the Normans? The thing, the, thing, the thing that you need to understand is that the colonial system really didn't own it. After World War II, the British and the French primarily were unable to maintain their colonies. They knew that. They were bankrupt. Okay? Yeah. Right. So what they did through the UN was they reformulated the colonial system and instead made the former colonies responsible for paying their own administrative police and military costs and buying, of course, bullet weapons and so on from the developed countries. Okay? And then the other major change was that instead of the colonial system being exclusive in that, say, the British could not trade freely in a French colony and vice versa, right? It became a system that was managed by now the G8, that is the, the, the eight richest countries. And so it's a joint colonial system in which the, the colonies don't have economic independence. They have political independence, but they're very easily controlled by the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and the World Trade Organization. For instance, you take a country like Ecuador, the IMF or the World Bank can walk into Ecuador and say, look, if you're not going to pass this bill we want you to pass, you're not going to have a government next week because you're not going to be able to get credit to pay your employees because they control the credit ratings and the, all the private banks will follow in train with the credit ratings that the international organizations give. And so they don't control directly politically anymore, but they control the ex-colonies indirectly through their economic vulnerability. And as Thomas and Jefferson death. said, he who controls the finance controls everything, basically, right?